A very good morning to one and all of us here. So, um, welcome, Arun. And it's very good to have the alumni back and to interact with the journalist. So, it's very nice to have him. And so, uh, Arun Ishwar, he has been a very good student here and he has been very active in association when he was in college and he was also the president of CEA when he was in the final year. So, I'll give you a brief intro about him. Uh, so after his B from uh, SPC, he has done his MS in civil engineering, constru uh, construction as a major from Virginia Tech, US. And after that, he has joined at Bozuto Construction again at uh, US, uh, which dealt with uh, material tracking and scheduling, etc. So it's basically there uh, related to construction management. And currently now he's in he's a real estate construction analyst at um, Consolidated Investment Group. So welcome you Arun. I hand over the session to you. And one more information for you. So the faculties have we have joined through GMeet, and the students are actually joining from their classroom. So we have projected the screen. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so good morning, all. Uh, glad to be back uh, uh, talking to uh, everybody at SVC once again. So uh, as Pam said, uh, I'm currently like a real estate construction analyst for Consolidated Investment Group. We are like a family office investment firm that uh, focuses on apartments and uh, warehouse uh, developments, real estate developments, as well as uh, investment into properties uh, across the United States. Currently, uh, the portfolio that we have is worth around uh, $2 billion uh, just here in the US and Israel as well. Uh, that's just a little bit about uh, the company that I work for right now. Uh, so let us get into detail of what uh, today we'll be talking about the real estate development process, guidelines, et cetera. So uh, what is like uh, a real estate development? So uh, the property development is a process of building new structures or modifying existing ones to increase the property's value. So if you have a raw piece of land, for example, the value of it might be, say, for example, uh, 100 rupees. But when you uh, <clears throat> have a building on that piece of land, the value uh, almost increases how many ever times based on uh, various factors. So that's kind of an example of what real estate development is. So uh, these developers are just entrepreneurs who identify like prime piece of properties that they can develop. They can either collect rent out of it or sell those buildings to uh, various other people's, uh, various other uh, parties involved in order to uh, get a profit out of it. So there are like a lot of stakeholders involved in real estate development. These include, uh, architects, engineers, uh, landscape architects, planners, uh, municipalities, cities, attorneys, a legal team, a consultant like a geotech consultant, a surveyor, uh, a title company, a lender who gives financing to you, and contractors, subcontractors, etc. cetera. So uh, it is not like a, just a one company process. There's like uh, more than 20, 30 different uh, stakeholders that are involved in developing a piece of property or a land. And uh, let's get into like what the types of developments are. So there are various types of projects that uh, property development can be done for. For example, uh, when you purchase a land and try to build out of it, it is called ground up development. So that's what we focus on mainly. So I'd be covering in depth more about what ground up development is. And uh, next is like uh, renovating, improving, or ext extending an existing property. For example, uh, you think that uh, if I add a gym to this apartment, it will probably sell better. That is uh, improving or extending that property. So those are called CapEx or value-add developments. And uh, third is like 
conversion of one purpose of a building to another purpose. For example, uh, a lot of hotels can be converted into apartments just by adding some kitchens to rooms. So this is a new concept that is emerging. So these are uh, kind of like a conversion developments as such. Like I said, let's uh, talk in detail about ground up development. So uh, multifamily development, these are what is called apartments that are built out for rent and uh, condominium developments are apartments that are built and sold to the users and uh, single family development is basically like building individual houses and villas for sale and warehouse development is like building a industrial property basically to uh, make sure that it can be rented for uh, various uses for example it can be uh, any distributor like amazon etc uh, then it is like commercial office development. So you uh, build an office and rent it out to various uh, tenants who might need uh, space just for their staff, etc. Now, uh, let me go in detail and a step by step approach of uh, a ground up development. Uh, so on the left, I've shown like a picture, uh, which was a real project that we actually did. So uh, initially, you got to identify like a piece of land just like that. And based on the piece of land, we need to have like a vision and establish the goals for that project. So we need to see what we can do with that uh, piece of dirt that we find. So uh, after that, we go to the pre-development phase. The pre-development phase has like a lot of steps, which is mainly the planning phase for this project. So in this phase, if we think that this project is not uh, viable in terms of economics or just uh, in terms of uh, uh, some features that you find in this piece of property that 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 makes it undevelopable, like bad soil, etc. So uh, in that case, you got to go back and find another piece of land. If it is viable, you then uh, make sure your pre-development phase is complete and uh, we can start construction on a project. But once you start construction on a project, whether uh, we like it or not, uh, at this point, we cannot back off. We need to make sure we figure out how to either operate this project or sell this project. So this is uh, probably we have uh, dragged our foot to down the line now. So we cannot uh, take our foot back at this point. So you got to uh, figure out how you can operate or sell this project somehow from there on. Now let's get into detail of uh, what uh, encompasses in a pre-development phase. So uh, there's uh, seven steps. Uh, one is like market analysis, feasibility studies, uh, then environmental impacts and surveys, concept plans, uh, acquiring the piece of land, then uh, getting a detailed set of uh, plans that uh, you can uh, use for bidding, as well as securing permits for a project. And then you have to arrange for financing for this project. So uh, let's cover each of them uh, in detail, step by step. So in terms of uh, market analysis and feasibility studies, uh, uh, there are three things that you need to look for uh, when you see a project. Uh, one is like physical analysis. So you got to see uh, whether uh, the site has like good soil, uh, what the topography is if uh, you have like uh, uneven surfaces where you have to uh, dig a lot of and excavate a lot of dirt and stuff that's going to be expensive if there is any overhead power lines that is uh, probably uh, just uh, moving along your property those are stuff that you might have to relocate so these are things that you look for in physical analysis and in terms of location analysis you need to make sure that your site is zoned so uh, when I say zone, it means that each piece of property has its own zoning in terms of whether you can build apartments there, whether you can build a warehouse there, etc. So we cannot find a land where uh, it is zoned for warehouse and try to uh, make sure you can build apartments there. So uh, if you want to do all that, it's going to be a detailed entitlement process, which is going to take months or sometimes years. So it's always uh, useful to find piece of property that is zoned for that particular use. 
and then we need to see uh, population trends how many people are moving in and moving out of that particular location where you want to develop your property uh, then you got to look for crime in that area target demographic who who is your uh, end user uh, are you uh, building it for the person you're going to be selling it for so that's a really important thing that uh, we need to look out for and finally uh, everything comes down to economic analysis so uh, there are like we use sheets and sheets the of excel that uh, generates these numbers in terms of uh, how you establish the project budgets and uh, what kind of rents you can charge what kind of returns you get out of it to make sure this deal is actually a viable uh, one for the company so uh, for the project that we were doing we figured out that the site was flat it had good access to infrastructure by infrastructure i mean uh, it had good access to storm sewer uh, all these uh, water lines etc so we did not have to uh, do an extensive build out and there were no environmental hazards like there was no presence of asbestos or contaminated chemicals on site so those are all good signs that a piece of property is uh, appropriate for development and uh, in terms of uh, location analysis we it, the site was 10 minutes from the airport it had good proximity to restaurants and entertainment and we figured out that it was more suitable for a younger demographic and uh, in terms of economic analysis we did uh, we figured out that uh, the surrounding areas uh, there would be a rent comp of uh, $1,335 per an apartment is how much you can charge per month for rent in that particular location and the budget that we established based on uh, our relationship with contractors uh, local city officials etc was around $187,000 per apartment and this company had like an IRR goal. So IRR is nothing but internal rate of return, which is like uh, on an annualized basis, uh, how much return uh, can you make out of this investment that you're uh, uh, putting in for this project? So all these three metrics, uh, if if all, all these three metrics are related, I'll show it to you in detail in the next uh, slide. So as you can see here, uh, the budget that we established was around uh, 187 and uh, the rents that we were able to charge were 1335 based on this we have to see what the returns were on a short stabilized sale and on a long term sale like a stabilized sale is once your property is 95% uh, occupied or 95% rented out and a long term is uh, somebody who makes just a cash flow out of your investment rather than a merchant uh, developer who buys and sells the property immediately so like i said 14 was the goal but we hit 22.35 so which made sure that it was a very attractive opportunity for the company and after doing uh, this first step the next step was to see uh, if there are any uh, environmental assessment service etc so it's mandatory to do a geotechnical report so this geotechnical report gives you an assessment of what kind of foundations you or what kind of uh, cut and fill you need to do for a particular project so uh, as you can see on the left it says that the site uh, soil was stable with regards to expansion so we did not need any expensive uh, foundations here uh, shallow uh, post tension slab foundation was sufficient in this project uh, so uh, it, it did not prove out to be expensive and was in turn uh, favorable and sometimes you need traffic reports so these are basically to, to prove to the municipality where you're building at to say whether uh, how your uh, how the property you're developing affects the local traffic so because you're developing around 276 or somewhat units if you are building so much there is going to be more cars that are going to be coming into the particular location so you got to show how your uh, development affects the traffic of that particular locality and thirdly it's like uh, the alta survey reports so basically these reports so show like where the storm lines are where the water lines are where the sewer is etc in order to 
make appropriate uh, connections and figure out how much infrastructure you need to build to get uh, access to water and sewer for your buildings, et cetera. And uh, then we go into what is called a concept plan phase. So uh, this is like a very important phase in a development. Uh, so you hire an architect who figures out how many apartments you can build in a particular site. So as you can see uh, in this image there, they just do a rough site plan to show how your building will look when it is laid out on that particular piece of land. And not just that, they also give you like a lot of metrics in terms of all that we were talking about, what the zoning is, uh, how many apartments you can build in this land. You verify all the information that you figured out previously uh, by this concept plan. So before you make offer on a land or you close a land, it's important to do this concept plan. And uh, as you can see on the left, uh, the architect gave us uh, some instructions that uh, the zoning for this piece of land was R5, which is R is, stands for residential zoning. So it was zoned for building apartments. Uh, they figured out how big the land was. It was 7.04 acres and a density is how many apartments you can build per acre. So you can work this zoning code, you can build 43.5 apartments per acre. And uh, we ended up actually less than that. So uh, that was that gave us 276 units. Then you also have to look into restrictions like how many stories or how many uh, floors you can build uh, on that particular piece of property. So uh, there is a four story limit and 48 feet high. So that's the highest you can build. So based on all these metrics, the architect figured out for us that you can build 276 apartments. So uh, one important concept is that you want to make sure that you can build as many apartments as possible on a land because say, for example, uh, the land cost was 10 lakh rupees. Uh, if you are building 276 units, you're going to end up at a, a per apartment cost of uh, 100, for example. It's not the accurate number, but just for an example. So if you... So if you're not building 276 and you end up with a lower number like 250 apartments, then your land price per apartment is going to be higher. So as you saw in the previous economic slide that uh, you're selling per apartment and not as a project. So you have to make sure you, you uh, budget it per apartment and you sell it as a per apartment so that uh, your economics uh, are viable for a project. So henceforth, you need to make sure uh, you maximize the site and build as much as you can. That's That should be a major uh, uh, factor in a multifamily development. Then once the concept design is done, the step four was to uh, basically acquire the property and put an offer on the land to make sure uh, the land is yours. And once the land is yours, the next step would be to do site plans, development plans, building plans, et cetera. As you can see on the right, uh, these are various different plans that are needed in order to build a project. Uh, everything from the site plan, civil plans, which show you all the infrastructure, utilities, et cetera. The architectural plans show you how the units are laid out where the kitchens are, where the bathrooms are, etc. how the corridors are spaced, etc. The structural plans obviously give you uh, all the framing details, etc. for this building, including foundations, etc. Then there's the mechanical plans, which shows you how to heat and cool this place. There's plumbing plans for your toilets, uh, sinks, etc. And there's also electrical plans showing the power, lighting, etc. for your building. We also have uh, here what is called a fire protection plant. So basically need to figure out uh, how your sprinkler systems are going to be spaced, how uh, what kind of sprinkler systems you're going to use, uh, what fire pumps you're going to use, etc. cetera. Uh, then you come out to the landscape plan, which is like uh, on the exterior of your building, uh, what kind of trees and uh, are you going to build a pool, et cetera. All that is shown on a landscape plan. We also have what is called a low voltage plan, which shows you uh, uh, your low voltage cabling details, like your internet, fiber, 
phone, et cetera, as well as any security cameras, all those stuff. And then finally, there's an interior design plan. Uh, it's basically to decide what color of paint you have, what cabinets you're going to have, what countertops you're going to have, all these kind of uh, details are given in an interior design plan usually. So this design phase usually takes somewhere between six months to eight months uh, in a total development cycle. And once the design is done, uh, we make sure we take this design and apply for permitting. So uh, there are various types of permitting that are required in order to build a building. Uh, you need a building permit, you need a site development permit, you need a stormwater permit, fire line permit, all these different kinds of permits are needed in order to make sure your contractor get, get started on this project. So this permitting time right now takes around three to five months. So uh, this can be a really extensive process uh, in a, a real estate development. And finally, we need to figure out how we are going to finance this project for construction. So uh, like I said, uh, you, you can self-fund this project. So if somebody has ready cash of $50 million, you can just go out there and uh, build the building on your own. But not a lot of people uh, have that ready cash. So that's why there's various forms of financing that people prefer to use. Uh, so one of it is called line of credit. So it's just like using your credit card. Usually uh, uh, huge uh, people with huge bank balances have their own line of credit. Uh, where the banks are comfortable with providing them with such such a line. Uh, so the advantage of using line of credit is that your interest rates are lower compared to uh, the fourth option that is shown here, which is like the banks or lending institutions where you apply for a construction loan. So LTV is called loan to value. Usually the construction loans work on the basis of uh, 30 to 70 percent. So you finance 30% of the project and 70% is given by the banks. And uh, the interest rates for this is uh, pretty much higher than the line of credit. So that's the reason why line of credit is preferable if one has access to that. And another is institutional investors. So basically uh, companies like JP Morgan, uh, Chase, all these huge uh, investment management companies, they want to invest in your project because they see this as an opportunity for them to make money. So they basically become partners in your project. Uh, you don't have to pay interest for them, but you have to return your profits to them based on the investment they have made. And uh, there's also an option of crowdfunding. So crowdfunding is just like you treat real estate as share market. So uh, anybody can come in and invest as much as even a uh, thousand rupees into a particular project. So that is crowdfunding where you acquire funding from a mass amount of people uh, to finance your project. Or you can go to friends, family, etc. For this project in particular, we use this line of credit. So uh, our owner does not prefer having partners or uh, he has a great reputation with uh, banks, etc. So because of this, uh, instead of getting a construction loan, when we had access to line of credit, we prefer to use that. And out of the 50 million required for this project, uh, 30 million was the credit we secured, and 20 million was our own company's equity that was put into this project. So once the development phase was done, next we entered into the construction phase. So uh, you have those set of plans. The next step was to go out and get accurate bids for that plans. So you uh, make sure you release those plans to multiple general contractors in a in your city or wherever to make sure who comes up with the best pricing uh, the lowest price is always not the best price so you have to make sure uh, the scope of what they are covering is always uh, appropriate uh, one person might do uh, 10 tasks and charge uh, a particular amount, whereas another person might have done only nine tasks. So you have to be able to figure out everything is covered when someone is giving you a bid. And then you got to negotiate that bid uh, with terms and conditions and the scope of work with, a with the presence of a formal contract. And uh, finally, uh, you have a general contractor on board and now you have started construction on your project. 
now uh, we also have to hire a third party testing or inspection company uh, the reason why we have to hire these third party companies uh, is because the design uh, the professionals that you hired like the engineers and the architects gave you a set of uh, guidelines for example the concrete breaks have to hit 3000 psi or whatever so uh, you have to make sure that this third party company uh, tests those concrete um, and make sure that the brakes are appropriate so that your building is built to the standards that it needs to be and then you have to make sure you get into project management phase so uh, here you have to uh, probably attend like a weekly meeting and uh, do regular walks on the construction site to ensure that uh, the contractor is not going over budget, is building the right building, the plans that you gave him to build, as well as uh, the timeline of this project is maintained because timeline, uh, time is really important. Time is money. So uh, time is really important to make sure uh, a development process is uh, a success. So project management is something that uh, happens at this phase. Then you are also responsible for managing local power companies and internet or phone companies to make sure you get power to your building, you get internet to your building, et cetera. These are stuff that the general contractor usually does not do. And as a developer, you have contracts with all these companies uh, and you manage them separately as well. Then finally, once the building is built, we have to get a certificate of occupancy to make sure uh, people can actually live in that building. So uh, to get a certificate of occupancy, your property must pass a series of inspections. Uh, these can include anything from a plumbing inspection, electrical inspection, a fire safety inspection, et cetera. These inspectors are different from the inspectors we hired for soil or concrete testing. These inspectors work for local cities and those inspectors usually uh, inspect all these items to make sure your building is uh, suitable for a person to live in and finally before you accept responsibility for a particular apartment and you get the keys and you take ownership you got to make sure that you walk throughout the apartment and identify any issues with respect to uh, damages or something that is missing etc that was supposed to be in the plans but that was not delivered to you so these are things that you need to look out for in the construction phase. So now we have constructed the building and we finally have a, a physical structure uh, that we can make uh, some money out of. And we have to make sure uh, we decide either to operate the building or sell the building. So whether you operate or sell is based on your personal choice. So uh, each company has their own goals. Some want to uh, hold on to a property for a long term. Some want to just uh, sell it and make sure uh, they move on to the next project and they sell the next project, etc. Uh, so if you're going to operate the building, you got to hire a property management company. So this property management company has uh, its own uh, number of staff. Uh, they might have like five to ten staff usually. These people are responsible for renting out your apartment units and uh, they also make sure they address any maintenance issues that arise into the building all these items are taken care of this property management company that you hire then uh, this uh, property and the building needs to be stabilized and secure permanent financing in order to sell the building so <coughs> remember that you still have a construction loan on the building for which you you are paying interest on so in order to make sure you sell the building you got to make sure you get a permanent financing on it so this permanent financing again depends on stabilizing the building so uh, like i said previously uh, building being stabilized means it is 95 percent occupied so if you have 276 apartments almost 270 has to be occupied in order to, to get close to the 95 percent <clears throat> so uh yeah once you have stabilized the building the next step would be to get that permanent financing the permanent financing is nothing but refinancing your construction loan so 
we are getting another set of financing to make sure you pay off your construction financing. So uh, at this point, you have a physical building. So banks feel more, more uh, secure in order to lend you uh, money at a lower interest rate. So that's kind of the reason why people switch to uh, permanent financing. And uh, your profit basically when you're holding the building is at the point of uh, after the rents that you collect after the loan payments you make and the expenses that you have on the property. Uh, <clears throat> all these subtracted uh, gives you the net operating income uh, <clears throat> for this building. Finally, uh, stabilization uh, is done. Next, our company has a long-term hold vision. So in this project, we did not uh, end up uh, selling the building. We instead held the building for a long term. However, the market conditions turned out to be favorable. And henceforth, our property is valued double. And henceforth, we got permanent financing for a higher amount than what we actually uh, needed so that ended up being a profit that was in turn used for future projects so this ended up being a good project for the company overall but usually development uh, has like a lot of unknowns so you always need to keep and watch for uh, all these unknowns that arise through each step as this is uh, just being entrepreneurial uh, each day as uh, instead of doing one particular uh, project and one particular product in other businesses here you do a different product each time that's the only difference between a normal entrepreneur and being a developer so you got to have that entrepreneurial vision in order to be a developer to be honest and with that uh, thank you today uh, if you all have any questions uh, feel free Thank you, Arun. It was a good presentation. So, yes, uh, any questions from the participants? Okay. So, thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. So, like you concluded, it was very clear the differences between developer and uh, entrepreneur and so you clearly explained what are all the different processes from stage one so it should have been uh, good content for the good knowledge for the participants also thank you and um, good to see that few of your friends also joined the uh, meeting so thanks to them also no thank you all the participants vignesh and gopal joined okay. thank you yeah. So thank you, Arun. Thank you. Thank you.